let's take a look at this grandfathering. And we want to ask ourselves the question, what do we even care? Anybody can see this? It's a little uh, light up here, so you may not be able to see it. Here's the machine that we built to create these goals. And the two congressmen on the steps are saying, it's a reminder of what we can do when we all work together. <laughs> and that thing looks like a Rube Goldberg machine. Well, grandfathering, the machine to do grandfathering, was inherently contradictory at the start. Because the public wanted to hear the politician say, and he did, you, if you like your plan, you get to keep it. But at the same time, the law was saying, wait a minute, we think there's certain things that every plan should have, but I like my plan without those things. Well, you get to keep your plan, but we think every plan should have these things. So you're going, well, you can't have it both ways. And right, you can't have it both ways. And so the grandfathering clauses were put in to try to paper over those differences. And the way to think of it is this. Imagine a whole set of rules, a whole set of rules like this for Papaka, OK? These are all the rules that people have to play by. But if you are a grandfathered group, you don't have to play with these rules except for one small slice of the pie. So they're going to take one subset, OK, like a slice of pie out of the whole set of rules, and they're going to say, these rules apply to you but the rest of the rules don't. So what we have to do is we have to understand, well, which ones don't apply, which ones do apply. And how do we end up handling these two sometimes contradictory things? And the contradictory part of it is simply because of the way government laws are written. For example, the law says if your group changes something in a significant manner, you can suddenly go from being grandfathered to being ungrandfathered. Now, when one asks the question, well, what is a significant change? Well, to you and I, for example, if you move from a HMO, $20 copay, and then put all your employees onto a $1,000 deductible PPO, would we all agree that's pretty significant? Yes. Yeah. Well, how about if you went from a four-tier drug card and the third tier, now let's say the second tier, the brand, went from a $10 copay to a $16 copay. That's the only change in the plan on the brand tier. Do you think that would be significant? No. But the law says it is. You see, yeah, $5 in that example. So there's all sorts of ways significant changes occur that we don't even know are significant. Now here's the other thing we've got to get straight right from the beginning. Remember in the first class I said, I want you to stop thinking of grandfathered plans because that's almost irrelevant. I want you to think of grandfathered groups because there is only one person who decides if he or she is grandfathered, the employer. It's what the employer does that makes him grandfathered or not. So when Mr. HealthNet gives you a plan that says this is grandfathered, what Mr. HealthNet is saying is that this plan as it existed on a given date in March in, 19, in, in 2010, that plan has changed in only insignificant ways, insignificant as defined by the law, only in significant ways or not at all. So as far as Mr. HealthNet is concerned, the plan is grandfathered because it didn't change but your group that has that plan might have changed. Having a grandfathered plan in a grand ungrandfathered group makes the whole group ungrandfathered. Yes. You can't rely upon just because the carrier says, now you say, well, why? Well, we're going to find out. One of the ways you become ungrandfathered is to change the contribution level. Now, how many of you enrolled a group, a uh, small group, in some plan two years ago, wrote down in all honesty and sincerity that the contribution level was 90-10 for the individual. And then, because of the rising inflation over the last two years, you've changed it to 80-20. Yep. Did. did you refill out the master app and go tell Mr. HealthNet? If you did, you're the exception. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the problem. Mr. HealthNet likely doesn't know you changed that contribution 10%. You just ungrandfathered yourself. But Mr. HealthNet can't possibly know that. 
there's no way he can you see papaka mandates that the employers operate their plans a certain way the easiest way to get these benefits obviously is to buy them in an insurance policy but can an employer self-insure himself yes does he have to follow all the papaka rules for benefits and all that yes he doesn't get to design just anything he wants but if he's grandfathered he can design certain things out or keep certain things out but the moment he loses his grandfathering got to do it it's a complicated way to blend these two conflicting aims you can keep what you have but you got to keep other things very complicated what do we got first whatever plan the employer has whatever he's giving to his employees as of March 23rd 2010 as of that exact moment it has to remain the same except for small differences we'll talk about what those small differences are allowed grandfathered plans as we said are required to implement part of the rules the slice of the rules okay grandfathered plans must comply with the subset Grandfather plans have to begin following these rules in, 23, in September 23rd. In other words, between March and September, an employer had a one-time thing to make retroactive changes to get himself into compliance on grandfathering. Once September 24th came about, once ungrandfathered, forever ungrandfathered. No way to go back. Got it? No way to go back, period. All right? They had a six-month window, and that was about it. A plan is grandfathered first if it existed prior to that date and then did not make any significant changes. And we'll talk about what significant means. First, why do I want to be grandfathered? Keep in mind what we talked about. All the preventive costs, the, some of the dependents over 26 that I could get rid of, maybe some COBRAs up to 29 that I won't have to handle. The appeals process, the internal external appeals process, the lack of all the full notifications, some of the notifications I don't have to do. All of those things actuarially we estimate are worth 5% to a grandfathered plan. In other words, they can save 5% on the premium. Okay, whatever their cost may be, self-funded or otherwise. Administrative costs are lower rather obviously, but most importantly, if I stay grandfathered, I can continue to discriminate. I can continue to get better benefits for my best employee, my best executive team, maybe my family members if I'm a small company and I can continue to get those discrimination, discriminatory benefits without being fined. This number one is why they want to keep their grandfather, to try to get a discriminatory situation that doesn't generate a fine. That's, that's what they want, okay? What is grandfather not required to do? Well, they're not required to cover adult children if those adult children are eligible elsewhere, okay? Uh, they avoid that COBRA issue we talked about in the first class, rather obviously, because the more I can keep those 26-year-olds out, the less I have a 26 to 29 COBRA opportunity. I get to waive those mandated benefit services, if that's what I want to do. I get to waive the part about no cost sharing. In other words, I could keep a plan that has benefit services, but charges $10 co-pays for it, whereas the non-grandfather plans can't do that anymore. Okay? Another cost savings. How about this one? Now, we don't have this in California, because this is crazy, but other states do. <coughs> if you're grandfathered, you can have a plan that says you must have pre-authorization for emergency room services. <laughs> now, think about that. The poor guy has a heart attack. He's unconscious in the ambulance. They're taking him to the emergency room. And when the claim comes in, they say, you weren't pre-authorized. I'm sorry, you need to call in advance before the heart attack. Oh, yeah. You say, there can't really be plans out there. <laughs> Not in California, but in other states there are. And by the way, the early HMO plans had stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah if you'd been around long enough, you'd have seen it. Where you go, this is crazy. That's why we changed the law. Anyway, if you're, not, if you're a grandfathered plan, you could still have that. Non-discrimination rules, we already covered that. How about this one? Specific reporting requirements that occur under PACA, you don't have to do if you're grandfathered, so you save administrative costs. Pediatricians, if you have a grandfathered plan, you can continue to deny pediatricians as a primary care provider. Now, that doesn't happen in California because we've already fought that, fought and got that over with, but in other states it does. If you've got a plan that does not allow a pediatrician as a primary care provider, what happens to your costs? They go down because you're going to the more inexpensive GP, as an example. You can save costs there. Here's another one. I love this one. If you have a grandfathered plan, 
you can require ladies if they want to go to an OBGYN to get a referral. You got you can, you can be kidding. <laughs> I know for a fact we banned that by about 1880. Is <laughs> I mean, but there still are states out there that are operating managed care programs that just say you don't go to the OBGYN, you go to the internist, you go to the GP. That's how they do it. Obviously, again, a cost saver. If you have internal external appeals can be waived. Coverage of clinical trials. In other words, under PAPACA, a health care plan for a non-grandfathered must allow your patients to be involved in clinical trials. The, the grandfathered plans don't have to allow that. Now you say, well, who do you care? Most of the time, clinical trials are paid for by the clinical trial person, but it's the fallout of the clinical trial. Once the patient goes through the clinical trials, he's now got all sorts of medical needs that he's starting to get treatment for, and it comes back and impacts the cost, on, impacts the cost of your plan. Grandfathered plans can just say, we're not doing that. Keep it out. Another cost saver for the grandfather plans. What, are they, what rules do apply? Well, obviously, changes in taxes. Those rules apply no matter who it is, like the $1 and $2 program, for example. Uh, cost reporting, you're still going to have to do the W-2s and all that sort of thing. Uh, automatic enrollment for 200 lives, that's still true, whether it's grandfathered or not. Uniform explanation of coverage. Remember our little thing that I said looked like a Warden Brown automatic? That thing is still required for a grandfathered plan. Uh, explanation of exchanges and the subsidiaries involved so somebody in a grandfather plan has an opportunity to go to the state exchange and they get informed of that if they wish and after 2014 the rules on prohibition apply to grandfathered plans not until then though all right what benefit change that are required well no lifetime limits ungrandfathered or grandfathered the annual and lifetime limits still apply. Remember, we phased those in. 750 last year, a million a quarter this year, two million next year, that kind of thing. Uh, medical necessity still applies on all plans. Limits on pre-existing condition exclusions. In California, we, we solved that problem long ago. It doesn't apply to us. Limits on new hire waiting periods. In other words, the law is going to phase in a maximum 90-day period. That'll apply to a grandfathered plan, too. Uh, Essential benefits, however we get those defined, will still be the same on a grandfathered plan. And obviously non-essential benefits will correspondingly be the same. And all that goes to no limits after January 14th, like everybody else. How do I stay grandfathered? I'm the employer. First thing I do is I stand up in front of all my employees and I announce, I'm grandfathered. Like the word from Mount Sinai, down it comes. Now I'm being funny. But that's who decides who's grandfathered, not the carrier. The employer must put into writing and into a notification that he believes his plan is grandfathered under PAPACA. If you know somebody did not make that notification, I would suggest you tell them to make that notification immediately as possible. At least make the good faith effort to put the notification out there. Whether that will save them if something goes wrong or not, I don't know. But better to have made a good faith effort. Because much of the law, because it's unclear, as we talked about in the first course, much of it does, for, does go on good faith compliance kinds of issues. Because the rules are not clear. But the grandfathering notification was supposed to have been done before September 23rd of last year. You have to provide a contact for complaints and questions about this grandfathering business. That's not a contact for appeals, because you don't have that issue to bother with if you don't want to, but a question about that, okay? And you cannot make any significant future change. All right, there it is. There's the official notification that should have already gone out. You fill in the blanks. There's page one, there's page two, and if you want a larger print of it, give me your card right on the back, send me the model, what they call model notice language, and I'll send you a copy of it, because that's pretty dang small. Uh, poor Keith is trying to read it right over here. He's about to have a heart attack. Uh, don't try. It's so small. Yeah, I'll send you the. Uh, I'll send you the entire list. Okay, get you the entire list. Now, the guy has his uh, plan. He thinks he's grandfather. He's told everybody he's grandfather. He sent out the model notification. I walk in and say to him, I'm curious. Where did you get the medical inflation factor 
from March 23, 2010 to today, where did you find it? Well, better yet, since you claim your broker helped you discover whether you're grandfathered, where did he find it? Anybody got an answer? If you have made a change in your benefit design that costs somebody 15%, more than 15% of, a, of, of the medical inflation since March 23, 2010, you're ungrandfathered. That's how I know your answer is ungrandfathered because there's no way $3,500 will, will meet that 15% criteria. It's way above that criteria. I bet, I'm betting 200% probably, somewhere in there. You see, that's one of the things we're going to use in our prospecting. Somebody says, I don't want to talk to you. Why? My, my, my broker did a great job for me. He kept me grandfathered. Did he calculate your 15% 15% hurdle against medical cost inflation since March 23rd, 2010. If the guy wants to get rid of me, he says, yeah. And I say, well, what did he tell you it was? Just out of curiosity. Where did he tell you got it? Just out of curiosity. You guys are pretty bright. You're in here learning the lessons. You don't know where to go get it. We're going to tell you where to go get it. It's Department of Labor. In fact, when we do our fifth course on math, we're going to lay it out for you. Because even more importantly than that, you see that date, March 23rd? If you got somebody grandfathered today, truly, absolutely, miraculously made it through, <laughs> okay? That measurement of the 15% is from that date. That date is anchored. He has to be measuring that every year. Every year he's grandfathering, he's have to gonna go back and measure the medical cost inflation from that date in 2010 till that date in 2012. And then in 2013, he's going to have to measure it from 13 all the way back. And you're going, well, that means he could literally be in the zone one year and out the zone the next. And once he's out, ungrandfathered and can't go back. That's why the Department of Labor lady said, ain't nobody going to be grandfathered. Any change of a copayment that exceeds either the 15% adjusted for medical inflation or more than $5. Oh, Any change of a copayment that's five dollar more than five dollars on grandfather's you. And that's why Mr. Healthnet or Mr. Etna can say to you this plan is grandfathered because they know whether they changed it the 15% or the five dollar copay. See, they can tell you that. They know whether they did that. But what they can't tell you, oh by the way, any change that reduces the annual or lifetime limits in a plan. That also ungrandfathers you. Any change in coverage that stops or reduces to effectively stop covering a particular diagnosis treatment. Let's say, for example, you got a guy, he was really nice, he had a rider in his plan for employee assistance, alcohol, drug recovery, and all that sort of stuff. And because the rates went up, he decided to pull that rider back at renewal just to save some money. What did he just violate? Yeah. Done. Done. He's non grandfathered. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. There's so many ways to become ungrandfathered. Making changes to the contribution. The probability of people making certain changes, which are so common, like the $5 copayment business, we get a whole group of people out there we know with certain are not grandfathered. And they're exposing themselves. Exposing themselves. How about this? You can't change your contribution by any more than 5%. In other words, you got a 90 10 single at this point. Your employer took a 36% rate increase and he did what we all do. Yeah. You moved it to 85 15, well, 80, let's say 80 20. You're out of compliance. But it's not just on the single, it's any tier. Any tier of similarly classed employees. So, for example, you held the benefits just perfect for your highly compensated employees because you're protecting them and you took the rate increase out on your lowest level employees. You just ungrandfathered your, your group. You took it out on the families. You were paying 100% on the single, you were paying 80-20 on the families, and you moved it to 70-30 on the families. Ungrandfathered your group. Any tier, any similar class group of people. If your contribution as an employer is based upon some productivity, like how many pounds of fruit you pick or how many garments you sew. If the production level changes by 5%, percent 
it's the equivalent of changing the contribution you're out of compliance you're no longer grandfathered okay now by the way the real question is why would they create a rule that is so easy because the answer is the people who pass this rule don't want any grandfathered plans it's as simple as that what can you do well you can add new employees and dependents uh, you can terminate employees COBRA still applies you can refuse to cover certain specific benefit services we've talked about that uh, you're allowed to keep the cost sharing under current uh, preventive services uh, here's you go the grandfather status of the plan is lost now this may be a little hard to prove when you get to a court case but the intent of the law is to say if you've done something with the ownership of a company in order to try to finagle in this case the grandfather clauses or any of the other clauses of PAPACA if you've done something such as you've done mergers acquisitions split businesses put businesses together in other words any company or corporate reorganization designed to thwart the goal and intent of the law is illegal okay simple enough because what the Congress didn't want somebody doing it was some clever guys like us figuring out well we'll just split two companies add two companies do whatever we're gonna do take care of this problem what they're really think of it the simplest way is this I'm an owner with common interest in two companies this company is clearly absolutely grandfathered over two years having kept it grandfathered its rates are now 10 percent lower than that group who wasn't grandfathered so being a smart guy I simply take the two co companies and I merge them into one company therefore pulling all these people in in theory as new hires and they become part of the grandfathered plan because I can add new hires the fact that my motivation to push those companies together was to accomplish this grandfathering dodge makes it illegal now somebody's always asking well how are you going to prove that in court I don't know how they prove things in court but uh, you know the tent to the law is to make you be is to make the government be able to take you to court so they don't want you doing that what else 100 percent coverage without deductible uh, we already covered that in network we covered that in the first course uh, items required oh here we go the preventive items recommended uh, with an A or a B rating by the US Preventive Services Task Force currently cover that in California immunizations recommended by the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices of the CDC Communicable Disease Center uh, preventive care and screenings for infants children adolescents supported by the Health Resources and Services Administration got bit you guys didn't even know this was in your current contracts did you oh, did you well that's good okay preventive care screening for women supported by the Health Resources and Service Administration further guidelines to be developed by August okay what is that it's the least likely the most expensive part of Papaka which is why people try to get out of it and more guidelines are due out in a month or so here's what we covered I don't want to read them all because it's just crazy these are adult stuff we covered here's some more adult stuff we covered depression screening for adults I think there's probably some in this case group here that <laughs> like that uh, immunization vaccinations we cover all those uh, let's see obesity sexually transmitted diseases services for women all these are covered more services for women more services for women more services for women children these are things we already cover in children and more things 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 and more and more uh, now how many what was that nine slides of stuff and I didn't go through the details you would be amazed if you actually go to those centers and download that stuff it's a it's a it's a reading they'll curl your hair now what's not covered in other words what doesn't constitute a change in grandfathering and you may say they've drilled it down to such a specific level like the 15 percent of the medical cost adjustment factor and yet they don't know if this is a change if I go from a health reimbursement plan to a straight major, major medical now that sounds pretty significant to me but not to Papaka they don't know if that's a change of significance or not so we're waiting on the jury on that I go from an insured plan to a self-insured plan I can at least understand that one because if I have an insured plan over here and I can understand the benefits perfectly so that I can construct a self-funded plan that is absolutely identical in every way that one I could get could be grandfathered because you haven't changed the benefit who pays for it self-insured or insured not the issue but they haven't quite decided that one yet either how about this one you're on a PPO or an HMO or you're self-funded and you rent a network 
if you drop one network you drop little sisters of Mary and you put in st. Joseph's IPA have you made a change yes. well the government doesn't know yet we don't know on that one yeah now how about this what if what if you drop fifty dollars fifty doctors out of a thousand man IPA is that a significant drop if 50 <laughs> is is five okay and on top of that when you talk about it the client not knowing how many clients know how many doctors in the st. Joseph's IPA at contract renewal didn't sign their contract and dropped out of the network and if enough of them did was that a significant change the one thing they have decided though if you now and here's the key if you simply change the name of the carrier if you're being insured by carrier a and you move to carrier B and every plan design is identical that's not a change they have made a decision on that now how many people can move from any carrier to another carrier and have no change it's silly how about changes in drug formulary we don't know that one if you have 500 drugs in your formulary and you take five out is that a change we don't know that one yet uh, we don't know obviously essential and non-essential services we're still waiting on that we're hoping to get that by September I said don't hold your breath we'll check what happens by the way if we get it by September we will get that out to you in fact what I would hope if they're going to release by September we may have it by the next time I track back to you in five weeks or so now why does it matter now that we know all this we've scared everybody to be out, of the, out of their mind what does it matter first when you say your grandfather mr. prospect there's so many ways you can invalidate your grandfathering for example did your broker explain the highly compensated employee clause and the effects that will have on you if you're properly grandfathered or not if he's not properly grandfathered what's he liable for yeah when the law goes in 100 bucks a day per employee yeah that is the biggest one that's why I think that's a great leader because I don't think a lot of the employers are out there are telling their current customers I don't think they are mr. prospect here's why it's mattered when you said you were grandfathered did your did your broker help you write the model notification that you gave to all your employees prior to September 23rd 2010 given the number of people who want that notification right now you know the answer to that is no they didn't even know they were supposed to do it now do I truly believe that guy will be hoisted on the batard because he didn't get that notice out quite properly or quite on time personally I don't think the government's going to do that I think there's going to be some wiggle room for good faith but when I'm prospecting a client I want him to understand the full impact of not doing it right because if he's working with a broker that doesn't do it right he should be working with me who's going to help him do it right whether I think he's at an enormous risk or a little risk because we don't know so we're going to use that as a prospecting tool to get those five minutes to talk to him okay what we're going to do next I want you to think about the last small group you sold two to fifty whether it be a month ago two months ago three months ago whatever the last one you sold and I want you to cite for me every federal state county municipality local uh, church law whatever you want cite me the law that you cited to that employer when he bought your coverage that remandated and required him to buy health insurance oh you don't have much to think about do you and if he bought it from you two months ago and there's no law to make him buy it why suddenly when there's a law that groups over 50 have to buy it is he suddenly going to change the way he behaves you didn't force him to buy it two months ago you're not going to force him to buy it three months from now or 2014 there are other reasons he bought it and those reasons are tied up in whatever he feels about his employees and in the next hour we're gonna make a great distinction between employers who if you don't educate them will think I can get my people insured somewhere else and failing to understand he can't get them to a doctor all the insurance in the world doesn't get you health care those are two separate issues and we're gonna slam a truck right down that opening to make sure our clients don't end up somewhere else in 2014.